In the ancient world of the Roman Empire, unwanted children were routinely abandoned or sold into slavery. Sadly, such cruel realities persist today in many parts of the world where families crushed by poverty abandon infants they cannot afford to raise or where desperate parents traffic children into child labor or prostitution. In tight and tragic circumstances, both during the Roman era and now, Parents might give their children up for adoption with the hope of offering them an opportunity for a better life and a more hopeful future. Roman society placed a high value on producing offspring and heirs. Childless couples, especially those with economic means, were often eager to adopt. Under Roman law, as with our own, adopted children acquired the same legal status and inheritance rights as biological children. St. Paul reaches into his rich Greek vocabulary and communicates the word of salvation through a legal term referring to Roman adoption of children who are not kin by birth. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. By using this analogy, Paul is making the case that the Gentiles, not an original part of the covenant community by biological birth, nevertheless become a full-fledged part of the community of faith through baptism. Only Paul in the entire New Testament uses this technical term for legal adoption. And every time Paul uses the term, its meaning comes through the forceful theological sense of describing spiritual adoption of children by God's gracious choosing. Such adoption is executed by the power of the cross and made personally efficacious to us through holy baptism. Now, by employing this vivid adoption image, Paul is not denigrating biological parenthood or Jewish believers. He also was a Jewish believer. He is making the simple point that the metaphor of adoption crisply encapsulates God's parental initiative in making us God's children. Now, in Paul's time and in ours, many folks with sincere religious intentions have perpetuated the point of view that faith is a matter of personal choice, free will, or conscious decision. But children who are adopted have nothing to do with their adoption. The wonderful Lutheran theologian Joseph Sittler was asked, in 1983, how he would define baptism. He said, it is an enactment of the fact that you weren't consulted in the first place. Paul's use of the adoption metaphor makes it crystal clear that God initiates a relationship with sinners out of God's own intentional grace and mercy without regard to the necessary but sometimes tragic selectivity and testing involved in our human adoption procedures. Out of great love, God adopts you and me as God's children. God is the subject and actor all the way through the process. As we read in Galatians 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, 
so that we might receive adoption as children. And out of this parental initiative, God did not stand aloof and leave the nitty-gritty work of the adoption process to an outside agent unable to understand our joy, struggles, and insecurities. In the fullness of time, God executed our adoption as sons and daughters through his own, his very own son, Jesus Christ. To put it plainly, God sent his son to gain other sons and daughters. Over and over again in pastoral ministry, I have been personally inspired by the stories of those who choose to adopt children under particularly challenging circumstances. Parents-to-be leave the comforts of home to go get children on the tedious turf of domestic foster homes or orphanages abroad. They step into harsh conditions bureaucratic corruption into the lives of sometimes neglected and rebellious children. Observe these cases and hear these stories and then consider how much more God went out on a limb to send forth his son born of a poor Jewish woman into the struggle of human existence, born into the jungle of spiritual systems full of meritorious works and devoid of compassion and belonging. How much more did God intervene by sending God's only son as the adoption agent? Yes, this Jesus willingly gave up his own lifeblood on a cross to pay the price for your spiritual adoption and mine. And when we survey that cross, we behold the once and for all execution of our adoption, our very own inclusion into the covenant community by God's own parental graciousness. You can count on that. You can take that assurance throughout your life. Never forget it. Beloved of God, on this Holy Trinity Sunday, during these times seething with flux and uncertainty, as we survey the cross of Christ as the place whereby our adoption was executed, as we remember today our baptism as the event whereby the power of the cross and resurrection become real in our own lives, let us rejoice. Let us rejoice in the freedom given by the Spirit and the assurance that we are children of God. Let us sing for joy that we may now address God even as Jesus addressed Him in the most endearing way. Abba, Father. Let us rejoice that in the face of all the powers that seek to shake our identity and fuel our fear, we can share the unshakable faith in God's certain adoption of us, expressed by Martin Luther in these beautiful words in 1535, and I quote, It is a very great comfort that the Spirit of Christ sent by God into our hearts cries, Abba, Father. He helps us in our weakness and intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. The Holy Spirit is helping us in our weakness and interceding for us. He merely utters the words of a cry and a sigh, which is, O oh, Father, this is indeed a very short word, but it includes everything. It is as if one were to say, even though I am surrounded by anxieties and seem to be deserted, nevertheless, I am a child of God on account of Christ. I am beloved on account of Christ the Beloved. 
Thanks be to God.